for his word. And something is wrong with that slide, too. Um, it cut off the video this morning, so I just wanted to give you the three-point conclusion of this morning's message, that the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits, regardless of the Great Tribulation, regardless of the Antichrist, regardless of the evil that comes on the earth, the people that know their God, aren't you thankful you know your God, shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Then in verse 36, that that is determined must take place. That that is determined shall be done. I take great heart and courage in that to know that God has a plan. It's not plan B, C, or D. It's plan A. And just the way God has determined that these things will happen on the face of this earth, that is exactly the way it is going to happen. You know, it's kind of difficult when you're around somebody that's always changing their mind, changing their plan, and they don't know with any certainty which way they want to go or head. Thank God God has it all determined, and it's going to happen exactly the way that God has laid it out. So just trust in the Lord. Sit back. Enjoy the trip. Amen. Someday we will enjoy seeing our Lord descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We concluded the this morning with another great promise of God's word as the chapter 11, Daniel chapter 11, verse 45 concludes, he shall come to his end, this antichrist, this little horn, this fourth beast, he shall come to his end and none shall help him. How many of you thankful that evil has an end? Hallelujah. My dad says evil has no limit, but it does have an end. Thank God it has an end. And everybody that has the victory say praise God. Amen. Look at that. Now they're working just fine. We're in Daniel chapter 12 as we almost conclude this sermon series on the book of Daniel. And I want you to pay close attention to these words. Daniel is speaking about the time of the end. For those that hold only to a classical interpretation of prophecy, I want to tell you Daniel chapter 12 settles the matter. It settles the doubt. The things that Daniel has seen is what happened then, what will happen again as a dual fulfillment of prophecy, and he is speaking the things that relate to what relates to the end. Look with me then in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to when? To the time of the end. And he goes on from there. Skip to verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for thy words are what? Closed up and sealed till the end. Daniel prophesying so many years before these events happen, he is told of greater things than we know in this prophecy, but to know that Daniel has been told by God to seal the book. Close it up. It is not for now. It is for the time of the end. God knows the end from the beginning. Amen. Thank God that God has this knowledge. It might be of interest to you to turn to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10, where John the Revelator is told not to close this book, not to seal it up, but John is told these words, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Why the difference for Daniel 700 years before the coming of Christ? He's told to seal the book, close the book. And then we advance forward to John the Revelator, and he's told, don't seal the book. Don't close it up. What's the difference? Well, it's clearly written in Scripture. Revelation 22 and 10, for the time is at at hand. Oh, Hick House in our church is 104 years old. I've known him for decades and decades, been his pastor for many decades now, and I remember years and years and years ago telling Hink House that he would go in the rapture. He's 104. I think he's waiting to do just that, to go in the rapture. Come, Lord Jesus, even so. <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus. But these things are for the end of time, and John the Revelator is told the time is at hand. This is about the time of the end. How many of you get excited about end times? How many of you can do anything about it? Well, actually, you can. You can pray for a shortening of the days. You, you can pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
You can pray as, as John did in the end of the Revelation, even so, Lord Jesus, come. It should be our earnest appeal, Lord, come, come, please. Shorten the days, lest the elect not even be saved in this time called Great Tribulation. But really, the fact of the matter is, you and I do very little other than that, to hasten the appearance of the Lord to hasten this time of great tribulation. It is all in God's timetable, and God the Father alone knows when the time of the return of Christ will be. Jesus said that he did not even know. For those that try to forecast the date, you're foolish for doing so. It's in the Father's hands, and it's going to work out just the way he said it would. We're in Daniel chapter 12 now, speaking of a time of trouble then a deliverance of thy people. This time of the end, at that time, shall Michael, the same Michael the archangel that we heard about in chapter 10 and chapter 11, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for who? For the children of thy people. I want you to know that God has never forsaken the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are his chosen people. They were his chosen people. They will always be his chosen people. God has a plan for national Israel. If you read the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you'll find that God has great things in store for the nation, the national Israel, the nation of Israel during the time of the millennial reign when they are given opportunity and opportunity to see the true Messiah, Jesus Christ the Son of God. Here is Michael, the archangel, and what is he doing as he fights these battles against the Syrians and, and other hosts that he comes against? He is standing for the children of his people. I wonder to ask you then, how many archangels does it take to defend the nation of Israel? Just one. I would suggest to you that he's pretty powerful, pretty potent. The power that he has in the body of Moses with Lucifer being cast out of heaven and all of these things point to a mighty powerful archangel. He is in defense of the nation of Israel, the children of God's people. Now the Bible speaks of a time of trouble. Whoa, trouble. Somebody sang the song, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Well, whatever trouble you've seen doesn't compare to the trouble that's coming to planet Earth. For the, God says there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. There will never be a time of trouble that compares to the Great Tribulation. I remember when I was a teenager, we saw that movie, A Thief in the Night. I saw it 37 times, and I got saved 37 times. But no matter how scary it was, you know, they even had a snake in that movie and all this different stuff and scared me and that clock going off and waking her, the girl up and she had missed the rapture not only in her dream, but she missed it for real the second time. I mean, it just run you to the altar. I'm telling you, you got to get right with God, be ready for his return and uh, see all that stuff going on. Yet in the middle of all these movies that we used to watch like that, there always seems to be a grassy scene and... Everything is pleasant, and it looks real nice for a little period of time, and then troubling things happen after that. I'm telling you, there's nothing but trouble in the Great Tribulation. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. There will be perplexity upon perplexity. Men will look at the rocks and say, fall on us as they seek death. Oh, my, a time of trouble. The New American Standard calls that word trouble the time of distress. We live in a world right now where everybody talks about how much stress they're under. Baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. This is a time of trouble. This is a time of distress. Think what Daniel had seen. In the early years of his life being taken captive, taken away from the, his home there in Judah and taken to Babylon as a captive slave, think of all the trouble he saw as two-thirds of his nation was wiped out during the captivity. And he writes that this time of trouble will be the greatest time of trouble the earth has ever known. For anyone listening out there who says, well, I'll just wait until the rapture and I just won't take the mark of the beast, good luck with that. If you can't serve God while it's easy now, 
you'll find it very, very difficult to serve him in the day of the greatest trouble the world has ever known. You think World War II was something? You have seen nothing compared to what is coming on planet Earth when there are seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven vile judgment that affect planet Earth. There's never been anything like it, a time of trouble, a time of distress, a time of perplexity. Never from the time the nation was created until these things occurred. And notice then, at that time, hallelujah, how many of you know God has a time? At that time, the time of trouble, thy people shall be delivered. New American Standard says they will be rescued. How many? Who's going to be delivered? Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Is your name written in the book? Be sure that your name is not blotted out. We have a great uh, hymn in our tradition called There's a New Name Written Down in Glory, but the theology's off. He doesn't write that name in. The Bible's pretty clear. This second Adam came and redeemed the sins of all the world, past, present, future generations. He died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. The second Adam undid what the first Adam had done in the garden when he sinned against God. Now what happens after that we find in the Scripture, if you want the biblical truth, names are blotted out. Names are blotted out. Check it out. It's the case. Oh, that your name would be written down in that book. The time thy people shall be delivered. Everyone sh that is found written in the book. It's incredibly important that your name appears in the book of life. Number two, there is the resurrection of the dead. Some to everlasting life and some to contempt. Look with me in verses two and three. And many, by the way, you should always pay attention when you're reading Scripture to the word many. He died for all, but only many will be saved. Consider what Jesus said. He, he, he took it even a step further than that. Many find the path that's broad, a broad path that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way, straight is the gate, and few there be that find it. Yet the writer, Apostle Paul and others, and just like Daniel of old, speak of the term many. Not all, many. If you believe in universal salvation, you should uh, read a couple of passages here in Daniel chapter 12, because not everybody is going to be saved. You can say amen. Not everybody is going to be saved, but many, many will. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some, not all, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. There is a separation for all humanity, a line drawn here that some will be saved, some will enjoy everlasting life, and some will face everlasting contempt, eternity without God. There's a line that is drawn and that line happens as these who are dead are raised from the dead. The Bible teaches us in the book of Revelation, blessed is he that has part of the first resurrection, because that second resurrection, that great white throne judgment occurs, and there is no hope at that point. He advises us then, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Let me implore you to be evangelists, to turn as many as you can to righteousness. The consequences are eternal. We've already read verse 4, but now let's consider it again that Daniel is told to seal the book. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book even to the time of the end. Again, we're not just talking about Egypt, the uh, king of the south, and Syria, the king of the north, and we're not talking about the three Persian kings that rise up and then they fall off, and those that follow after them, and then that fourth little horn that, uh, that emerges. We're not talking about the past. We are talking about the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, or many shall go back and forth, 
And the Bible says, Joe Thomason, the, the Bible says, knowledge shall be increased. I bet I've heard him and I talk about that more than twice. Knowledge shall be increased. Have things changed in your lifetime? How many of you used to have a manual typewriter? The rest of you aren't paying attention. How many of you had an electric typewriter? Maybe a fancy one, an IBM Selectric or something like that. Yeah. Where is it? Do you still use it? Ron, you gave me one years ago. It's still up there in that attic. Anytime I need a typewriter, I go up there and I type all I want. A lot of things have changed, haven't they? We used to think about knowledge, how it would double every 10 years, every five years. I'm telling you, knowledge doubles every time you turn around. Knowledge increases. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> knowledge increases. Let me ask you something. Has the great knowledge of our world done anything to make man better and less depraved? The increase of knowledge is foretold to us. It will happen, and it is happening. Knowledge shall be increased. Make no mistake about it. It is prophecy, and it has come to pass over and over again in your lifetime and in mine. I, tell, I hear people from time to time in the church say, well, I hate change. I hate change. And when they say, I hate change, I say, do you have a cell phone? Evidently, we don't just totally hate change. Some of you do more than others. All you guys that are still carrying flip phones, you have the right to say you hate change. <laughs> Bob Hale was being teased about his flip phone and uh, why he hadn't moved on into the future and get a smartphone. He said, listen, the only reason I have this flip phone is because the the bird died. <laughs> the pigeon died. We say we hate change, but we're very comfortable with our flat panel TVs, aren't we? One time I went to buy a flat panel TV. It was pretty large. My wife said, Dan, you can't do that. What will the people think of you buying a TV, flat panel TV, so large? And then I visited some of your households, and I saw how big your flat panel TV was. I said, Esther, don't worry about it. They've got TVs much bigger than ours. Knowledge increases all the time. Used to be a fascination of mine, the fax machine. Remember, the old fax machine? You can send something to the other side of the world using a fax machine. I don't even use a fax machine anymore, right? We all use this computer. Knowledge has increased. Knowledge will continue to increase. And man is amazed by his knowledge, but his knowledge solves nothing. It solves nothing. In fact, in many ways, it creates many more problems than it solves. Next, how long shall this sermon last? Over and over again, in the Old Testament particularly, but also in the New, the question comes up, and even in your life and mine, the question comes up before God, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? You'll find that in chapter 12 and verse 8. One said to the man clothed in linen, possibly the man clothed in linen is Christ himself, but nonetheless, to the one clothed in linen, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The answer is given in verse 7. The end of that verse says it shall be for time, times, and a half, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Every conservative writer that I know describes time, times, and half a time as three and a half years, 42 months. So when you get all wound up about the Antichrist, always remember what I've been preaching to you in this series. He only has 42 months. 42 months is not a long time. His time is very short. What will he hope to accomplish during this time? He will scatter the holy people 
and all these things shall be finished in this length of time. I heard and I understood not. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up, sealed till the time of the end. And we've already given you Revelation 22 and 10, where the revelators told not to seal the book, but in Daniel's day, he is to seal the book. Number five, the righteous and the wicked. How many of you know there is a difference, a distinction between the righteous and the wicked? It should be while the wicked are heading downward in their depravity. That, letter, that ladder of deprivation mentioned in Romans chapter 1, when they knew God, they worshipped Him not as God, became vain in their thinking, foolish hearts were darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And on down goes the ladder of deprivation until it ends with homosexuality and all of these different things that are mentioned. Idolatry before that. All of these things are mentioned. The ladder of deprivation, you would think as the world is becoming more and more depraved, how many would say, man, the world is getting more and more depraved, you would think that the righteous would be becoming closer and closer to God. Shouldn't that be our path, our trajectory? While the world is going downward, shouldn't we be going step by step upward? Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost heights and catch a gleam of glo glory bright. Oh, someday we'll proclaim, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Problem is, while the world is going down, many places the church, though better than the world, is heading in the same trajectory, perhaps down, or perhaps just the status quo suits us all. I pray that in these last days, the status quo will never be good for us, that we will be looking to plant our feet on higher ground, pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Come on, church. It's an upward path. Hallelujah. We're marching to Zion, the beautiful, beautiful Zion. Let's head that way and not as the world is heading. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The righteous and the wicked, and again in verse 10, we find the word many. Not all, but many. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried. How many of you want to be in that number? Purified, white, tried, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. But the wicked shall do wickedly. And how many? None of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand. You can disagree with me on technical points regarding these prophecies. You might have a different opinion. Every commentator disagrees with the other one. But the reality is the truth of his coming and the truth of this great tribulation that will happen on the face of the earth, it's a reality. And no man by any voice can change it. And the wise will understand. How many of you are going to be wise as you see these scenes unfold. Number six, blessed is he that waiteth. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, we've talked about that, we'll mention it again, and the abomination that maketh desolate. Remember that Jesus spoke of that in Matthew 24 and 15. Just the way Daniel expressed it is exactly how Jesus quoted Daniel in Matthew 24. Daniel chapter 11 and 31 also brought up the same topic, the abomination that maketh desolate. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, you want to keep track of these numbers because there's stuff coming up here. Do you know what the revelator said of those number of days? He said one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Well, here's Daniel, and he's saying one thousand two hundred and ninety days. And many look at that, and they, they are scoffers, and they say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. I don't believe that for a second, do you? that the Bible contradicts itself, but nonetheless, Daniel mentions 1,290 days. But not only that, in the very next verse, he gives a different number of days. He said, Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the 1,335 days. That is exactly 45 days later. 
Here's what one writer writes about the discrepancy of these times. Sometime after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist enters a treaty with Israel. This begins the seven-year tribulation. At the midpoint of the tribulation, 1,260 days later, the Revelation speaks of that number, the Antichrist breaks the treaty. He desecrates the temple. He begins to persecute the Jews. That's exactly what he does as he takes away the daily sacrifice. The abomination that causes desolation he enters into the holy place of God and he persecutes the Jews. At the end of the tribulation, 1,260 days after the desecration of the temple, Jesus Christ returns to earth and defeats the forces of the Antichrist. I just want to tell you that on the day, that 1,260 day of John the Revelator, on that day, all our problems are solved. Come on, somebody get excited about the coming of the Lord Jesus. 1,260 days, it really doesn't matter what happens in the next 75. God has a plan for all of these things, and his scripture is without error. The writer goes on that during the next 30 days leading up to 1290, after the desecration of the temple, Israel is rebuilt and the earth is restored. In 30 days, the writer says that Israel will be rebuilt. That's pretty miraculous, don't you think? But when Jesus shows up, I think you can expect the miraculous. During the next 45 days, leading up to 1,335 days after the destruction of the temple, the Gentile nations are judged for their treatment of Israel. And I don't know if that's true or not. It's just one commentator's voice. I've looked at four or five, and none of them agree with the other. I do know this. God's timetable is perfect. And just as he wrote it in this book, that's going, how it's going to be. Jesus is coming again, and that seven-year period called tribulation will end. That 42 months of that tribulation when the Antichrist is in control of all things that are wicked and evil in the earth, that too will come to an end. How do I know it? Because of this morning, Daniel chapter 11 and 45, that which is determined must take place. Thank God. How many of you like to wait? Patience has never been my virtue. I've never met a man named Patience. And all the women said, I said the women said, Patience. Yet you and I throughout the pages of Scripture are called upon to wait. And of course we have the idea of waiting just like uh, we're waiting. No, Jesus clarified it for us. In the Gospel of Luke and the signs of the times when he said, In patience, possess ye your souls. We are waiting. We are watching. We are praying. We are hastening unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many are going to say, where is the promise of his coming? That suggests that because he hasn't come yet, he's not coming at all. Let me assure you, after this service is over tonight, I will be heading to Jose Peppers. I will be eating something should the Lord not come between now and then. You can take it to the bank. Now, it hasn't happened yet. It'll happen. You know what I'm saying? How ridiculous, how foolish is it for him to say, where is the promise of his coming? It hasn't happened yet, so it's not going to happen. Yes, he who shall come will come and will not tarry. Glory to God. And we're called upon to wait. To wait. Verse 12, blessed is he that waiteth. Really, we're speaking as he spoke to the churches in the book of Revelation. He that endures to the end shall be saved. How many of you are going to endure to the end? Blessed is he that waiteth cometh a 1,335 days. Next, thou shalt rest. What does that mean? That means you're going to die. Go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest. And you're going to stand in thy lot. When? At the end of days. What did Job say? Job of old said, I know in my flesh that I shall see God and that he shall stand in the what? The latter day upon the earth. Here is Daniel being told that he will rest and yet he will stand at the end of days. So uh, Stephen has told me that I'm out of time and I'm halfway done. 
And so I promised you everything you wanted to know about the Antichrist and more. And more. I want to ask you some questions. You think people are kind of uh, consumed with thoughts about the Antichrist, predictions about the Antichrist. They kind of all have that in mind. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. How many times is the word Antichrist found in the book of Revelation? How many, how many times is the word Antichrist found in the book of Revelation? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Six? Five? You, Don, you are a smart guy. It is not found in the book of Revelation. There is another word found in the book of Revelation. In fact, in context, it's found exactly 25 times. It's called the beast. Revelation 13, 1 through 4, you can read about the beast rising out of the sea. Here is this, what we would call Antichrist, but uh, the, uh, John doesn't refer to Antichrist at all. Okay, so you did good on that one, Don. Of course, you have notes right in front of you. And this is kind of an open book test, if you can count. How many times is Antichrist, or it's plural, Antichrists, how many times is Antichrist mentioned in the entire Bible? Keep counting. Five. Second John 2.18, as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. First John 2 and 22. Who is a liar? He that denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. There are a lot of Antichrists in the world, aren't there? First John 4 and 3. Every spirit that confesses not Jesus Christ come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. We all talk about that. The spirit of Antichrist. Where you've heard is in the world it should come. Even now is already in the world. Second John 1 and 7. For many deceivers are in the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. Five times the word Antichrist appears in the Bible. All of them in the epistles of John. Who is also not only John the beloved, John the apostle but John the Revelator. What are the biblical names for the Antichrist? See, you don't have these in your notes, do you? What are the names of the Antichrist? In Daniel 7, 8 and Daniel 8, 9, he's the little horn. I think that's God mocking the devil. He's just a, just a little horn. Three kings of Persia, they go away. Those that follow in their estate and then rises a, just a little horn, and that's what we've been talking about in this series. Paul speaks of the Antichrist and defines him in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3 that he is the man of sin, that he is the son of perdition. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And finally, in the book of Revelation, catch this, 25 times in context, 25 times the Antichrist is described to us as the beast, the beast rising out of the sea. Well, now, let's see how fast we can finish this sermon. Everything you wanted to know about the Antichrist and more. Frankly, I could care less about anything about the Antichrist. I know he comes. I know he is defeated. I know he is sentenced to hell. He and the false prophet are spending eternity in hell. And that's good enough for me. But follow along as quick as you can. In Daniel chapter 7, we find him being very boastful, speaking great words. He's slain, his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. Hey, he deserves it. He has made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He subdues three kings. He speaks great words against the Most High God. He shall think to change times and laws. Beware of that one. That's all around us today. He shall change times and laws. He will be giving time and times and the dividing of time. Again, that 42 months months, three and a half years, his dominion shall be what? Taken away, consumed, and destroyed. Guess what? He's the loser. Christ is the victor. All glory and praise be to our God. If you're scared of the Antichrist, stop it. If you're worried about it, stop it. If you're trying to predict who it is, stop it. You make yourself foolish to try to predict who this person is 
because the devil has no control over the timetable of these events. Daniel chapter 8, he will wax great. He will wax great even to the host of heaven. He will take away the daily sacrifice. He will cast down truth to the ground. He will perform his will, and for a time he will prosper. He'll be a king of fierce countenance, countenance with sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. His power will be a satanic power. When this individual takes a mortal wound to the head described in the book of Revelation and he rises again, it will not be by his own power. It will be by Satan's power. And his, all of his authority will be based on satanic power. He will prosper and perform his will. He will thrive for a time. He shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. He will be the enemy of the children of Israel, God's own chosen people. He will cause deceit to succeed by his rule. He will magnify and exalt himself in his own heart. He will even stand and rise against the prince of princes, that is Jesus, and he shall be broken without hand, without human means. Read the coming of the Lord Jesus in the book of Revelation. What does it take to overcome the beast, the false prophet? It takes the appearance of Jesus. And it's over. It's done with. The Word of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and that is the end of the story. What did we find this morning regarding the nature of the little horn, this antichrist, this beast, this man of sin, the son of perdition? Daniel 11. He shall do according to his will. He will stand in the glorious land, Israel. Why is Israel always the center of attention in the world? It's because God has it all planned just that way. He will enter with his strength of his whole kingdom. He will stumble and fall and not be found. Come on, praise God, that's exciting. He'll stumble, fall, and not be found. He is an oppressor who shall be destroyed. He's a vile person coming peaceably by flatteries as he takes over the world. Then he will spoil with riches and scatter the people. He will do mischief or evil. He will speak lies. Why will he speak lies? Because he's just like the devil himself speaking these lies. His heart shall be against the holy covenant. He shall have indignation against the holy covenant and regard with them that forsake the holy covenant. He'll have high regard for them. He will pollute the sanctuary. He will take away the daily sacrifice. He shall, uh, he shall place the abomination that maketh desolate in the temple of God. He shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself. He will magnify himself above every god. He shall speak marvelous things about the God of gods and prosper till the indignation be accomplished. He will not regard the God of his fathers. He's a Jew. He's a Jew. He will not regard the God of his fathers. He will not regard the desire of women. He will be a homosexual, regardless of what modern Bibles change the word to say. Why do you think all this stuff is happening in our culture today? It's all preparing for a time of such an evil just like Sodom and Gomorrah of old, so it will be in the end of time. He will magnify himself above all. He will acknowledge a strange God and increase with glory. He will rule over many, but friends, he will not rule over all. For out of every tribe, nation, kindred, tongue, and people, there will be those that will not bow to the image of the beast. They will face a martyr's death. Who are these that have come out of great tribulation, washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb? Wow. He'll do according to his will, exalt himself, magnify himself above every god. He'll speak marvelous things against the God of gods, our God. He'll prosper. How long? Verse 36, till the indignation be accomplished. He'll not regard his fathers nor the desire of the women. He'll magnify himself above all. He shall acknowledge a strange God, increase with glory, rule over many. He'll divide the land. He shall enter into the glorious land and overthrow many. He will have tremendous wealth. If you believe in a pre-tribulation -rap pre rapture, he can have our houses. He can have our money. He can have our lands. Take it all. That's all right. We've got a better place to go. Finally, verse 45. He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in where? 
the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Somebody thank God. He is defeated. I know not all of you carry the King James, so I took the time to put it in the bulletin. Here is everything that you want to know about the Antichrist in these verses. Revelation 19 and 20. And the beast was taken. With him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. Hear the word of God. These were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. My dear friend, that is all you need to know about the Antichrist. He will be destroyed. There's a line that...